NLPs, mashing up machine learning and AI. From the MIT Media Lab, here's Russell Stevens. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a presenter's dream because we are on the eve of an indescribably bizarre presidential election, and I get to talk to you about a presidential election. Uh, so it couldn't be more relevant. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about um, the electome and what we mean by uh, uh, when campaign journalism meets uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we at the Lab for Social Machines at the MIT Media Lab uh, have built essentially a uh, machine-driven uh, mapping and analysis engine that takes a look at the public sphere conversation on Twitter and in the news about the election and tries to make sense of it. And then what we've done is turned that mapping and analysis into a set of tools for journalists to use in analyzing the election uh, in a different way. If you would like to learn any more about what we've built or actually sign up and try it, please feel free to go to uh, electome.org and sign yourself up and play around with it. It's, uh, it's going to have a life well beyond the uh, actual campaign. Uh, when we uh, talk about uh, the electome, it's uh, certainly uh, a team effort. Our funders have been Twitter and the Knight Foundation. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our work with the uh, Commission on Presidential Debates in the Museum. Uh, very importantly, we've had a series of uh, media partners, uh, including the Wall Street, uh, Washington Post, CNN, Fusion, Bloomberg, so forth and so on. Uh, I'd like to spend one uh, minute on the actual technology behind uh, the election, uh, the electome, but want to start first by uh, talking about why. Uh, so over the last 50 or 60 years, presidential election coverage has become more and more like sports coverage. Uh, Nate Silver took it to a whole new level in 2012. It's about polls and odds and projections, who's winning, who's losing, fundraising, and so forth and so on. And that's great, and we all love to consume it, including myself, except uh, it's not very good for democracy. To the extent that the coverage and the conversation overwhelms the coverage about the issues and what's most relevant to us Americans, uh, then we don't have the kind of competition of ideas that is essential to American democracy. So in our very modest way, we've set out to shift some attention from uh, who's winning and losing the campaign to what it's actually being fought over. And here's the machine that we built. Uh, it's essentially a semantic and network analysis machine that takes a look at the full Twitter firehose. So that's 500 million tweets a day that we're sifting through to find out uh, what, which tweets are actually about the election. And we have a sort of fire hose of news media coverage as well, five to 6,000 stories a day. And what we do is we actually sift through all of these and ask one very simple question, is this tweet or is this news story about the election? That is a non-trivial thing to do for a machine. We have over 93% accuracy at doing that in an automated way. The next question is actually more difficult, and that is, of the tweets and stories that are about the election, which topics is it about? And when I talk about topics, I, t I mean about the issues, immigration, foreign policy, guns, et cetera, but also the candidates and other named entities themselves. And as you can imagine, there's lots of tweets that mention Trump and immigration or Hillary and healthcare and so forth and so on. So you can think of that as a very detailed map of how people associate candidates and issues. Uh, in a full-blown content map, then of all the named entities, the people and the organizations that uh, show up in that content map, we pull out their Twitter handles and look at the relationship between and among all those folks on Twitter. That's a very uh, uh, comprehensive network map. And when you put the two together, you get what we call the electome, which gives us the ability to do all sorts of different analyses uh, of, of that conversation in the public sphere. Uh, I'm going to do a quick fly through demo of this. It's not going to do it justice, but the long and the short of it is, is that we're able to, over a series of time that's uh, horizontal up top, we can take a look at the share of conversation on any combination of topics that we've coded for to understand the share of conversation during that period of time on these topics. And it gives us a very interesting view of what 
issues people think are relevant to them as we go through the election. We throw all of the tweets that are involved in this analysis into the right-hand column so journalists can take a look at what people are actually saying, and there's some other analytics that you'll see. So in this case, we're looking at roughly August and September. I've chosen a selection of issues. Uh, and the issues are shown there. Foreign policy, national security, by the way, has been the dominant issue in this whole campaign. Uh, you can take a look at certain events. He went to uh, Mexico in, in the end of August. We see that immigration conversation jump, foreign policy, national security, in a commander in chief forum about that topic, and then that's the first debate. We're actually able to take a look at polling um, so that we can eyeball how, polling, how polls uh, match up against this information. And the other note is uh, tweets that mention Donald Trump have outnumbered Hillary mentions two to one during the course of the entire campaign. That's been very consistent. We can take a look at tag clouds. Uh, as I said, we can look at the actual tweets. And then finally, um, we can actually take a look, and this is something that no one's been able to do, is look at the distribution of all of this by state and look at states that are over and underrepresented in this. Uh, and take a look again at how people are associating each candidate with certain topics throughout. Um, and one last feature that's been very, very helpful to us is you can do a search of words that may have come up. You might remember when Hillary referred to the deplorables. Uh, you can throw that into the same share of conversation and try to understand um, which topics, uh, when people are mentioning deplorables, are uh, is that most associated with? And in this case, it was racial issues. What this allowed has allowed us and our partners to do is uh, create some uh, analyses and some stories that uh, that uh, the platform forms. So, for example, the Washington Post has done several analyses that have looked at the uh, dominant conversation at any point in time. Uh, in, in the middle, a very interesting thing is we compared a public opinion poll to Twitter. And what's, what, what we're trying to do here is not replace public opinion polls, but to understand that this is conversation in the wild. This isn't a question and answer session on a phone, but this is conversation that's naturally occurring in the wild. And you can see, for example, racial issues on Twitter indexed uh, at 12% um, uh, of people's most important issues versus no one in a poll. Uh, we have done looks at how people have framed specific events. In this case, it was the Orlando shooting, and people framed it more as a guns and terrorism issue as opposed to an LGBT or immigration issue. Uh, we have taken a look uh, also at um, how conversations have evolved over time. So before Trump came in, the immigration conversation was referred very much as a pathway to citizenship, it was a real strong policy discussion. And after he came in in June, you see the rise of this wall narrative that people picked up in Twitter. Uh, we have uh, over 40 uh, deployments uh, to date through news organizations and on our own. It has actually been quite a challenge in this campaign, frankly, to uh, try to get uh, journalists and even ourselves to focus on the issues. This is a remarkable campaign with respect to how much personality and identity have played into this conversation. Uh, the Commission on Pe Presidential Debates asked us actually to take some of this analysis and help brief the moderators so for all four of the debates, we actually provided briefing books to the moderators um, that, uh, that uh, again, looked at this national conversation and try to put it into some semblance uh, of organization that they could understand and ask questions about. And most recently, uh, we have a, uh, an installation in the museum uh, in Washington, D.C. that allows people to actually do hands-on analysis as well. Um, so that is a very, very quick fly through of the uh, Electome. As I said, feel free to go to electome.org and sign up for it, play around with it, and uh, we'd love to have your feedback. Thanks. Joining Russell, he's on the board of the 4A's Leadership Council. From Trillia, please welcome Seb Mitra. So, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for having coming me. in and doing this. And this is kind of late, and still there are a lot of people here. Um, so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Um, so the first thing we probably all want to know is what was the genesis of this? How did you guys even come up with this? 
So sure. talk a little so bit about that. So it always starts uh, at a research lab with what the students want to research. And uh, we had a number of students who wanted to uh, really do breakthrough work on things like semantic and network analysis, so natural language processing, machine learning. So you start building tools, mm -hmm. and then you realize, well, uh, you need to actually point the tools at something. It's the old hammer in, uh, in, 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 hammer in search of a nail. And um, you need, at that point in time, a very rich data set. And you were looking for, in this case, with NLP of Twitter and news, you're looking for a subject that people talk a lot about, that gets a lot of news coverage, and that's very relevant and uh, sort of an obvious thing to point it at. But um, uh, with respect to actually pointing it at this election, it's an uh, offshoot of some work that I'd done for my uh, master's, th master's thesis uh, six presidential elections ago, which wow. uh, I'd done a lot of coding of political communication by hand with a VCR and a checklist. And now uh, the students have the ability to uh, to look at hundreds of millions of tweets a day uh, in an automated way. So uh, it was uh, it was something that we knew how to do, um, but we really needed a very, very relevant data set. Good. So, so there was not one single problem you wanted to solve. You had this tool, this NLP, mm -hmm. and you wanted to actually point it to That's right. some direction. Yeah, we, um, we, we wanted to really try to turn people's attention towards the issues. And um, the ability to actually, in a very, very fine-grained way, um, understand what people are just talking about in the real world from day to day. Now, Twitter is obviously not completely representative of the conversation that we're having at our right. dinner tables or even private communication on Facebook. But we wanted to try to understand what was most relevant um, to people without prompt in a, in a, public, in, in a public opinion poll um, in any other form of, uh, of survey. Right. So that brings me to two questions, actually. Uh, so the first one is, if you look at all the polls and, you know, 538 to Upshot to Real mm -hmm. Clear Politics, they're all trying to predict who is going to win, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is very different. This is, this is right. about ideas and issues That's as right. opposed to trying to yeah, predict. Yeah, this is a step-back machine. Uh, any news partner that we began to work with uh, would start with, can you give us sort of hour-by-hour hour analysis during a debate or real-time analysis during the debate? And they all then they wanted you to sort of move you towards a predictive angle. And we really resisted that um, because we wanted to almost take a, it was a half-step back machine to take a look with a little bit more perspective at what went on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've stayed away from any predictive elements and really tried to be explanatory as a po in terms of what's actually happening. Right. So... The other question I have regarding this is if you if you go back to the first debate, we saw that there were a lot of snap polls, online polls and stuff like that, and, and Trump basically grabbed all of those and mm -hmm. announced that he won. So uh, clearly there was a lot of bias and the news organizations quickly understood that and they actually stopped reporting on them or, or maybe even stopped you know, even collecting that data. Do you see that that kind of bias might be already there in the data set? Because, again, we are talking about Twitter data mostly. Yes. And so. Yeah, we, we, we openly admit Twitter is not, is not representative of the general population or the voting population. We actually thought it was going to be more of an issue for partners like the Washington Post. But they recognized the value and just having some sort of a complement to public opinion polls, the fact that this was happening in the wild was enough for them to say, in every story they wrote, they would say, look, this represents the Twitter conversation, mm -hmm. not the conversation among the voting right. population. So the theme of this event is 2020. Do you want to quickly talk about what you're thinking for the next election? Yes, absolutely. So uh, what we're thinking about doing now is, uh, uh, whereas most of the analysis that we've done has been about what people have said, we actually want to move it towards who's saying it. There's been a lot of conversation about identity and identity politics in this election. Mm -hmm. And our ability to take a look at networks and understand um, who's saying what uh, and when and how they're associated with other networks and how are the people within these networks associated with each other um, is a very important piece. It's called cocoons or filter bubbles. And right. some of the things that we want to take a look at is uh, how can we actually start to build bridges between cocoons mm -hmm. so that we can get away from some of this very, very tight clustering that we've seen in the network analysis right. today. Right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.